Now we're going to turn to those fields of artificial turf being installed more and more on school playgrounds and athletic fields. There are an estimated 3,500 of them across the country. But new concerns about health hazards have led to an investigation by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Here's ABC's Sharon Alfonsi. It's become part of the American landscape. He may go! Synthetic turf. It's everywhere, from stadiums to neighborhood soccer fields. But now, questions over whether those fields are safe. A study in Connecticut looked at the rubber granules that make up the artificial soil. When heated, the turf emitted chemicals that could irritate the eye, skin, and respiratory system. Chemicals believed to be a carcinogen. Uh, the infill, for instance, is uh, it's crumb rubber, it's recycled tires. Uh, for instance, to do a football field, it takes 100,000 recycled tires. And each tire has hundreds of chemicals in it, several of them considered by the state of California to be hazardous and cancer-causing. The same chemicals found in these playing surfaces. Chemicals like benzene, ethyl benzene, formaldehyde, naphthalene, and styrene. And that's not all. These fields breaks down and it creates a fine dust. That dust can be inhaled. And of course it can be ingested. People use the fields, their hands get dirty, their face gets dirty, they wipe their hands on their and their mouths. I mean, there's times when you hit this thing and you get the black pebbles all over you, and that's not good, but um, you know, you wake up like two days after and you still have them in your hair and you're trying to wonder why. The granules stick to the ball. I'll catch it, it'll stop the ball, but not the pellets, and they'll go into my face, go into my eyes and my and now you just be running and someone kicks some little beads up and go in your eye and then you got to come out for a couple plays. Hey, can you get this out of my eye? It's like uh, the black stuff. You know, sometimes I don't know how they get in your socks. They're in your pants. Uh, it's just like, it's the worst. Those things end up in the weirdest places. Uh, when you take showers, you realize where they are. And for some reason, it seems like that stuff has crazy glue on it because it likes to stick no matter how much you wipe it off. The question of how good it tastes is also an issue. I chew gum every game, and uh, sometimes you take a nice little spill and it flies up in your face and it gets in your gum. Even holders are at risk. When you kick, you'll hit the ground before you hit the ball, and that sprays up all the, the rubber pellets in, into his face and his eyes and stuff, so he's always complaining to me about getting a little pellet shower whenever I kick. The fact is this stuff doesn't stay on the field. It comes home with the kids. He just put 15,000 pounds of rubber in this baby. 15,000 pounds. Sounds like a lot, right? In fact, over a million pounds of sand and rubber are in every field. A typical full-size field would have somewhere between 30 and 40. They are being diverted from landfills and tire piles for processing at plants like this. Rubber is chopped and ground into a fine granular material called crumb rubber. Actually, I shouldn't be touching these. Consider this fact. On average, close to 10 gallons of oil are used in the production of a single automobile tire. We mix together uh, natural rubber, synthetic rubber, and a cocktail of other exotic materials that are then fed into a mixing machine to create the compound. There's a whole mixture of other secret ingredients that go into there. Each one of these hoppers contains uh, an ingredient, but unfortunately we can't tell you what's in there. That's our secret recipe. But this is, these chemicals and, and these ingredients are mixed into the compound, um, which then goes through into the construction of the tire. In actual fact, leaving the natural and synthetic rubbers aside, more than 200 different materials are combined to manufacture the tire. There is carbon black, silica, and sulfur plasticizers, vulcanizing agents. It's no longer an inert material. It's no longer a filler material. It's now a functioning technical material. Any small carbon black particles or dust while also producing hydrocarbon gases. We're dealing with talcum powder kind of consistency at large volumes. It's not necessarily the soot that you can see that's the problem. The real problem is the tiny things you can't see. Fine particles can contain heavy metals that are very, very toxic. They can contain particles that are radioactive. They can contain heavy metals like arsenic and mercury. 
metals and the brain don't mix very well. Uh, they, they actually have profound effects on the development of intelligence in children. They affect behavior. They affect the ability of people to have healthy children. Fine particulate matter remains suspended in the air for weeks, for weeks, okay? So fine particulates from the soot you can see is also going to be suspended in the air for weeks. Welcome to the world of the nanometer, a unit of measure that is one billionth of a meter. A nanometer is pretty small. Uh, one of the best analogies that I like to use is to compare it with a human hair. If you take a hair off of the top of your head, you can see that it's very thin. And now if you take something that's 100,000 times thinner than that, that's a nanometer. And what scientists have discovered is that at the nanometer scale, everyday materials start to act in unimaginable ways. The behavior of nanomaterials changes, or can change, when the size becomes so small. When you have things that sort of start changing the way they behave, um, it sort of opens up an entirely new phase space of material. Suddenly, it's like the periodic table projects out into a new dimension. <laughs> it's not just that we have the list of elements, it's where we can change their sizes, and each size is a little bit uh, different than every other when it's very, very small. They're making these engineered nanoparticles, and they're using them everywhere, but no one knows about their toxicity, and no one knows about the long-term effects in the environment. The nanoparticles end up in the sewer, or they end up in the sea, they go in the rivers, and so you've got a vast sink of nanoparticles in the environment. So there's a great need to know the toxicity or the deleterious effects of these nanoparticles. In December 2006, the city of Berkeley amended its hazardous materials law to include nanoparticles, making it the only local government in America to regulate nanotechnology. Well, it turns out that if you take materials and start looking at them when they're sized in the nanometer range, their properties indeed do change. And scientists didn't know this before until we started having the tools to be actually do this. Toxicology has a lot of problems, and uh, nanotoxicology is amplifying these problems. I think that, first of all, the toxicology had enough problems without nano. We know that nanoscale materials can enter inside cells, and we know that that could have consequences for health. And so it's incumbent, it's really required, that we do research to understand what is the nature of the interaction between new engineered artificial nanoscale materials and living systems, not just cells, but whole living beings. According to CDC, one out of every six American children now has some kind of neurological disorders. It's because of chemicals in our society. I'm concerned that there are questions that haven't really been looked at or answered, but we've got these fields out there. The questions about the health effects really need to be resolved. They came out with the patently uh, ridiculous conclusion. They had showed it was toxic and then said it wasn't a risk. It made no sense, and only in an Orwellian world would you accept that. Our children playing in what's virtually a hazardous waste dump, I think. These fields are here to help our children grow up strong and, and athletic and, and vital, but if at the same time they're ingesting chemicals uh, that are harmful and that will show up later in their lives, then we're not doing them a favor. A high school soccer star has his dream of playing college soccer blocked by cancer. It's rekindling the debate over whether the artificial turf is somehow responsible. Luke is heading to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center for treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma, just diagnosed last summer. I didn't know what to think at the time, because I mean, I I've never been diagnosed with cancer before. But Luke's parents soon found out that other soccer players had. His keeper coach knows about eight, is that what he said the other night? Eight players that he has personally worked with who now have um, cancer. They wonder if it could have something to do with the artificial turf they play on. It's a matter of money, it's a matter of convenience, but what about the children that are actually playing on the field? What's going to happen to them? We are not going to let our young ones play on fields that could harm them. 